What's up, guys? Welcome back to Couch and Courtside. It's a special episode uh, covering the Olympics. And like I was saying, we're back with our official 2020 Olympic correspondent, Greg. Greg, how are you doing today? Doing well, Johnny. How are you doing today? Doing pretty well. So there's a lot of things that we can talk about. Uh, favorite games that are coming out mm-hmm. or that we've been watching and then, you know, talking about the Olympic fantasy draft. But I want to talk about a couple of things here that are kind of... Uh, near dear to us in the U.S., which is uh, Simone Biles. She right. has been in the news a lot lately for the past uh, mm-hmm. several weeks. A couple hours ago, as of this recording, you know, she withdrew from the vault uneven bars for the yeah, Olympics. Yeah, I saw that too. Status for her last two individual events is to be determined. Now, if you guys haven't heard, a lot of it is based off uh, citing off of her mental health that... You know, she mm-hmm. claimed that she has like the twisties and can't really focus on it. There has been a lot of people in support when it comes to her coming out and talking about mental health, which, you know, as a person that plays sports, I I understand a lot when it comes to physically seeing someone get hurt. But it's always mm-hmm. hard to judge a mental health, but we should be treating it like as it's a physical injury. Uh, because you can mess up when it comes to that. And and there's a lot of athletes uh, that have been coming to support of her, especially, you know, her teammates, but uh, athletes across the world. But there's a lot of naysayers as well. Like, people like Charlie Kirk, who, who, I don't know who this man is, but I mean, he's basically told his radio listeners, you know, we are raising a generation of weak people like Simone Biles, if she's got all these mental health problems, don't show up. You know, she's an incredible athlete, of course, incredible athlete. I'm not saying that. She's probably the greatest gymnast of all time. She's right. also very selfish. She's immature and she's a shame to our country. I, no. you know, so before we get onto my take, what is your uh, feeling so far about Simone Biles and then this discussion about mental health and uh, just critics from both sides of the aisle? Right. Well, thank you for asking. Um, I think I think our society has been putting a lot more awareness towards mental health, and it's becoming more and more of a realization that like this is an important need. Just like how if you sprain your ankle, you shouldn't keep running; you should stop and take care of that. You know. And I mean, over time, there's been lots of great Olympic athletes who have made a name for themselves, and that's come and gone. But I really feel like right now with Simone Biles, as well as also Naomi Osaka, uh, for both of those women stepping away from their competitive or respective sports when they felt like they needed that mental break is going to be huge. And I think those are going to be names that stick with us for a long time coming forward. Um, You know, Biles and so many other athletes have just had it forced upon them for this expectation of greatness. And they keep feeling that to push for like, newer and better things when Biles uh, uh, two games ago, I believe it was started making her own moves and wowed the Olympic judges with like, what do we even call that? How do we even score that? You know, she kind of set a standard or an expectation that most athletes now feel they have to like meet and exceed. If you want to see a really interesting video, go look up the history of the uh, balance beam in the Olympics back in like black and white, like the thirties and forties, it's literally just women just, standing on the balance beam for as long as they can and like can you walk across this but now you have these girls flipping in the air landing in the full split and then like having to immediately pop up and then like do cartwheels of back and forth in this thing so they just keep raising the bar higher and higher and like raising the risk higher and higher and when you go to full-on training when you dedicate years and years of your life to this thing there's so many sacrifices you have to make in your life and a lot of them you can't see You know, a lot of them are going to be mental sacrifices, including not being able to develop other parts of your life or relationships that you might normally want to, to a healthy level. And when you dedicate, I think, so much of your time towards establishing this identity of yourself as I'm Simone Biles, I am this gymnast, I'm this athlete, or, you know, I'm, I'm Greg, me, I'm this person, and I have this one talent and this one talent defines me. And then suddenly you get a case of the yips or the twisties or whatever you want to call it, where just for some reason you can't find that flow. You can't get into your groove that you're used to, to be quote the best that you're supposed to be. 
that's going to shake your mental health significantly and really make you question maybe even your own identity. Like, who am I if I don't have this? So I, I think it's very brave for her to, in this middle of this competition to be like, I'm not in a good place mentally to handle these competitions. And I know if I go forward, there's a high risk I might get hurt. You mentioned that she just recently said that she's not going to be in the vault and the uneven mm -hmm. bars, and she has two unanswered uh, events. I would be shocked if she actually goes through with those. I think she was most likely going to step out of those as well. And you know what? Good for her. I think that she is a well-decorated Olympian and a well-decorated gymnast outside of the Olympics as well with many titles. And I think that she's done an amazing career thus far. And I think if anybody, she has earned the right to say, you know what, I'm going to set this out. I think my other team has got this. And I think it's important for us to recognize other people's needs and not just be like, well, where's our gold medals? Let's face it. At the end of the day, the amount of gold medals a country gets, it's just a number on a spreadsheet. It, it's not like we get something for that. It's just pride. And I think it'd be better if we have pride in supporting our athletes more than whipping the donkey to go out there and, you know, earn more medals for us, you know, like why, why beat that horse until it's dead? How about you take care of it? And then you can get possibly a few more years out of it of whatever kind of productivity or enjoyment that you can. So I, I, I really applaud these athletes and I hope that the others in my country as well as the rest of the world can see that this is a growing concern and we need to maybe take a step back and reevaluate. Is it necessary to be pushing people this hard or can we just go back to focusing on what these are just games? Yeah, I, I hear you. And I, you know, agree with that sentiment a lot. I will tell you like, at least for me, when it comes to the sports, if you were to tell, if I was here, 21-year-old me, and I heard mm -hmm. this news about Simone Biles, I would be, alongside a lot of these people, um, in terms of, like, you know, gut it out. Men up, as you would say. But but we've learned right. so much, and how I feel about mental health um, over these course of years, that I, it is a real thing, right? It, it is something that is real, but it's not something that you can visually see, because it, it's all inside the head. Now, you know, you are going to have people like Piers Morgan here who tweeted, you know, are mental health issues now the go-to excuse for any poor performance in elite sport? What a joke. Kids need stronger models, not this nonsense. And he's not the only person that I would say thinks about this, especially when it's a sport that athletes know that comes and competes once every four years, you know, every two if you're counting Winter mm -hmm. Olympics, but it's one every four years. So you're preparing for this role. But I'm very proud of people like Simone Biles and then Naomi Osaka, who did this with the Grand Slam earlier, because, right. you know, 21 year old me didn't face this much online media, which is like, you know, with the advent mm -hmm. of not only Twitter, right. Instagram. You know, you know, now you got like TikTok, Snapchat. It's like the media is just there, which means that it's just got amplified by a thousand. And mm -hmm. I hate to say it, right? Unless you were born without using social media, like you're going to get on it. And it, it just happens, right? And, and And the best way to kind of avoid these things. Now, people might think it's a cop out, but I don't think so because I rather you acknowledge knowingly that, hey, I can't do it, right? And, and and this is very pertaining to people that play golf as well when they get the yips, right? Because they're right. trying to putt and then, you know, something happens. But, you know, back then we weren't allowed to admit that. You just got to play through it. But mm -hmm. what if taking a back seat, this actually will be better? And for all the people here, like I'm not the biggest gymnast expert, so I defer that to actual um, experts in the sport, not political mm -hmm. pundits. She was already the GOAT before coming into right. Tokyo. She would have just added a sprinkle on top of her being the best that ever is up until this point. Um, but I think it's it's crazy to think that like even an issue like this, it, it's 
how do you see us as a as a society in the U.S. to be able to start accepting mental health as an actual illness as a la, like, if you're breaking, you break your ankle, right? You broke your arm. How do we, as a society, kind of overcome people like Piers Morgan that just thinks it's just man up, just, just show up, do your best as you can, even though you know that doing this might actually cause you more harm in the long right. run? I think, I think it's based upon just time. I think it, okay, so Johnny, you and I are both film lovers. And we know that Hollywood is run by certain generations at a time. And you can track what generation was in charge of Hollywood at a certain time based upon what movies were getting made. In the 90s, the boomers were all in charge of Hollywood. That's why you see revivals of things like Dennis the Menace, the Flintstones, you know, all these like cartoons that they grew up with because they want to see those live action movies. And now that, you know, our generation is the ones that are in charge of Hollywood, we're starting to see revivals of like Transformers, you know, uh, Power Rangers, things like that, and Ninja Turtles, because those are things that we grew up with. We want to see that. I think that the mentality of like, walk it off, you know, and oh, stop crying and like, you know, like suck it up. I think that those are hard boiled and baked into previous generations. And as much as we can have a conversation with them and you can change one mind at a time, I don't think we're ever going to change the entire perspective of that generation or previous generations. I think that this is just about spreading news now to the younger generations whose minds still have that flexibility and letting the younger, younger generations be brought up with this. Let's bake that into our raising and teachings of those generations that mental health is a thing and it's something you need to be watching out for. Just as much as you need to brush your teeth every day, you need to do little mental exercises just to kind of reaffirm to yourself right. your self-identity. You know, there is uh, this psychological uh, pyramid called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, where at the bottom you have things like shelter, food, warmth. But at the top, you have things like friends, self-acceptance, self-actualization of your true self, you know. And while it's not as important as food, shelter, warmth, they are important. They're still part of that structure to yeah. help you become a fully happy and well-adjusted person. And I just think, like I said, previous generations, they didn't have that model or they were focusing too much on the bottom supports, the foundation didn't care about the cherry on top. So I think in terms of something like that, it's going to be baked in. And also kind of segueing off of that, I think another thing that's going to take a while, but hopefully we're starting to get the change, is how we treat women in general in the Olympics, especially with the outfits that they're being forced to wear for our, uh, for our games. Uh, recently, uh, many of you may have heard that uh, the Norwegian women's uh, beach handball team was refusing to wear these skimpy cut outfits and wanted to wear just normal kind of shorts. Uh, and they were each fined $175 per player for this infraction. Thankfully, the um, sitting artist Pink stepped up to actually pay those fees, which I think is amazing. But I mean, at the end of the day, like, what's the point in having these mandates for the uniform and how it has to be a certain cut? I don't think that matters. I think that if you look at different, even just swimming events like diving, some people have two pieces, some people have one piece. Doesn't make a difference there. So why does this make a difference to handball? I, you know, it's just, it, it flabbers me because you, you can argue, oh, having a higher cut means that the hips and thighs are unimpeded and allows a greater range of motion, right? Okay, then why aren't all the men wearing banana hammocks when it comes to <laughs> these sports? Why aren't the men not taking advantage of this great and, you know, revelation of this undeniable edge that the women are being forced upon? Right. You know, meanwhile, in other sports, women are allowed to wear shorts while running back and forth. Like tennis or batman, they're dashing back and forth. They're jumping. Mm -hmm. uh, they're lunging and doesn't seem to impede them. The other night I was watching the uh, women's skateboarding event okay. and a lot of those women or girls in this case, because some of them were young as 12 or 13, they're wearing baggy jeans and like pants. Damn That's right. not getting in the way. That's not getting in the way. So <laughs> to me, I think that this is just a ridiculous and mandatory sexualization of athletes that is completely ridiculous and unnecessary. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that the athletes should have the option to wear what they feel comfortable with so that that way they don't have that on their mindset of, oh, how do I look, but more focus upon how am I performing? And I think that really any athlete that goes out there should just have a few criteria. They should have any safety regulations or sensor devices like with fencing or with uh, water polo where they do have the ear protections there in case the ball hits them on the side Mm -hmm. that the sport demands. I think, of course, it should provide enough modesty so that it's not considered public nudity because these are meant to be family-friendly environments. Mm -hmm. So my banana hammock example was a bit extreme, but I think I got the the parallel across. Um, And then lastly, it should just denominate what nation they're participating on behalf of and when necessary, individual names and team numbers. Other than that, have at it, you know, if Johnny, if you want to go compete against me in a high dive and you're going to wear speedo and I'm going to wear a full wetsuit, who cares? As long as our form is right when we go down and we do the right style pike or half twists, judge me in my wetsuit, judge him in his speedo, who did the better actual combination of moves and who hit the water at the best angle. I hear you. And, and, and it's funny how it's beach volleyball and tennis that the two comparisons you have because... Beach volleyball is super hypersexualized sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, I just remember the Dead or Alive game. I was going to say they had a whole <laughs> game about that. Yeah. I also remember so Top Gun. People, so you so know, many they... boys butt just because of the sport <laughs> of it all. Right. Uh, so yeah, I totally agree with you. Like like uniforms, as long as it doesn't give someone an actual like mile advantage, right? That, that, that's something that can be kind of discussed and looked at as long as it kind of follows the regulations. So I agree with you there. But let's move on. Well, I mean, I yeah. can't imagine a uniform giving someone an advantage. Like, what, are they going to have, like, a bubble level on them as they're falling down? They can check it, real quick. How's, exactly. how's my angle? <laughs> so we'll move along real quick. It, this topic you had uh, circled in the first time we were talking, but mm-hmm. I kind of push it to this one. So... Growing as a kid, I think one of the cool things that I've noticed when it came to the Olympics is that I always like to see where the next site host is. Right. I, I think that's genuinely, I'm all like, can LA get it? Can LA get it? <laughs> well, and we, we don't do get, get it. it. It's we're just like, we're not going to get it until like 2028, I think. It, right, yeah. So, um, but I, I like those things because it's like, oh, it seems mm-hmm. like a lottery um it gives us time to like get really excited and like build it up because we're gonna have the most incredible athlete athletes at a certain country depending on where you're at but as i got older i've come to realize this lottery is just who has the most money to be able to spend who has the most influence uh it's not really even a lottery it's they bid for the attention of the olympic committee correct there is bribery involved there's backroom negotiations Uh there's political maneuverings and it all comes down to pretty much who kissed the olympic committee's ass the more the most right and and i think what this olympics highlighted and you wanted to talk about is just not only about uh maybe wanting to do like a permanent site but it has a lot of economical but also like what is it ecological like uh, yeah very events as well so talk to me about that okay so one of the problems that we're definitely now having more relevant to us with these olympics is the idea of just like you said ecological waste with these stadiums it's been well documented in the past that once as once the olympic games are over those stadiums pretty much almost immediately fall into ruin and disuse. No one cares. I mean, maybe in a few examples or for a few arenas, people will still use that that playing field for whatever sport it was. But for the most part, especially the more exotic things, like, for example, the uh, bobsled and luge tracks for any Winter Olympics, almost none of them are used anymore. And they're just these rotting structures there that are just ready to fall down and collapse. There was photos of the Rio games and some of their uh, uh, arenas within a year after the games were done, graffitied up, looking like trash weeds growing up where the stands were. So these things are almost like Coke cans. We're like, as soon as we're done, we just crush them on our forehead, toss them behind us, not even coming anywhere near the can, and we move on. And that's extraordinarily wasteful. And I think... And then look at what happened here with the Tokyo games. 
Tokyo built these amazing arenas to the same standards as all the other ones with seats that could hold thousands of people to watch a table tennis match. And yet, because of COVID-19, nobody's there. They built these whole stadiums, and nobody's allowed to go to them. Maybe just a few family members or some cameramen, and that's Mm -hmm. it. And it's creepy. It's almost like like it the world's over and you know we're just going to play this because we have nothing else to do it's kind of like a weird like twilight zone vibe yeah and so it the reason why tokyo was so pressured to have the games this year is because the olympic committee said listen if you don't have it in 2020 you don't get to have them and we'll just skip you and tokyo's like what we built it and i say tokyo not japan because a lot of time the onus of building the thing goes on to the particular city Mm-hmm. The government itself will help, but usually it's the city itself who has to do all the planning and paying and everything and construction. Right. So Tokyo's like, we, we're we building these arenas. We don't want that to have been for nothing. Yeah. So they let them have this one-year extension, mm-hmm. if you will, to go to 2021. But now they have it, and they're thinking like, oh, great, the vaccine's coming out. It's going to be, oh, now Delta's here, so now we can't do this at all. <laughs> right. And so I've been saying this for years that I really, really feel like we need to stop traveling to other countries, other cities all the time for the Olympic Games. We need to establish what I think would be the perfect number of three cities to have permanent structures on that we just cycle through. So in my mind, it's going to be one in North America, mm-hmm. one in Europe, mm-hmm. one in Asia. Okay. Preferably of a high enough latitude so that it has winter snow and summer weather. So you can do a summer games and a winter games at the same location. Got it. So, so you'd be able to be in use every two years. So, right. Um, so for example, if let's say it's Toronto, let's say it's um, London and let's say it's Beijing, right? Okay. Since those are some of the recent ones, Toronto winter, London summer, Beijing winter, Toronto summer, winter, London, Beijing. So you just keep cycling like that. You just ABC, ABC, and it'll just naturally go winter, summer, winter, summer for them. And in the meantime, while you still have those years in between, you can, you'll have the main structures there. For example, if you look at what we have right now with the kayak canoe course, they're all pretty much the same. It's just uh, like about a 30 foot wide artificial river that they make, and they just put different obstacles in the way. You can change that up from year to year. And other flex spaces should be made. So like if you want to have a flex space where we're going to try skateboarding out, okay, we're going to do that. If it doesn't work out and we're not going to have the next summer games and it gets back to you, tear it down. Put in whatever else other space you're going to have there. But let's face it, some sports are always going to be there. We're always going to have soccer for the Summer Olympics. For the Winter Olympics, we're always going to have hockey. Yeah. So you can build those stadiums. Just have some mild maintenance on the in-between years so they don't fall into complete dis- disarray. Maybe even rent those spaces out to teams who want to practice in an Olympic stadium in the off years. And that way we don't have this waste and we can have all this focus on these few sites. And then my other idea for it would be that we still have the bidding war for who's going to host it. But that city, so let's say it's going to be in Toronto, And let's say Mexico City wins it, right? So Mexico City is the one who's going to set the schedule. They're going to be the ones who design how we're going to move the things. They can can decide what arena is going to be used for what and what the flex space is going to be. They can take care of all the maintenance and main construction that needs to be done. But like I said, the the bones are there. All the plumbing and all the infrastructure is there. I'm, I'm reminded of the movie that came out last year, Euro, uh, Eurovision with Will Ferrell, where the main point of that is, oh, like Iceland, we can't handle Eurovision because our infrastructure is so tiny, there's no way we could host this. But if you have a structure that you're willing to let a foreign body host, then other countries can try to host this. So Iceland could host the Olympics, and then we can get a taste of their culture in this predetermined location. So that's my pitch uh, to the world for uh, predetermined locations. You guys can pick what city that's going to be. But I think, like I said, North America, Europe, Asia. So that way we do get that kind of globe trotting sensation. And then 
nations can go in and host them as need be. Greg, that is a very sound and logical point that you've made. And it sounds like not only does it protect uh, the environment as a whole because we get to reuse these sites, Mm -hmm. Um, but now that it's a fixed location, we're not always trying to muster something up as a city that comes up every three years, right? Because it's always a ramp to like what to build, where to build it within that city. Mm -hmm. Uh, and usually these guys plan because it's a, a billion dollar uh, entity at this point, right? To, to do all this stuff. But yeah, I'm also, and, I mean, we talked about the, the LA Olympics are coming up in the mm-hmm. next couple of dec in the next decade or so. Johnny, you and I both live in Southern California. Where are they going to put this? I've because LA is kind of built out. I don't know where they're going to put half of these things. They're going to set any one onto the train and they're just going to have to hop along and go to <laughs> your staples is going to be one. The new football SoFi stadium is going to be another right. when Balmer builds his Clippers stadium in Inglewood. It's going to, you know, it, it, and it just, it's ec- economically ecologically sound. I just mm-hmm. think that like, it takes away some of the muster, which, you know, I'll read some of the cities that have hosted before, right? You got right. Munich, Mexico City, Tokyo, as we know now, Rome, Melbourne, Berlin, Amsterdam, Paris, At- Atlanta. I, yeah, I'm still baffled that we somehow got Atlanta to host one, right? Right. Sydney, uh, Beijing, like, 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 I guess some of the feel of it is that, oh man, we get to actually embrace a whole country uh when they get to host but you know in this time of climate like i understand what you're saying because it it, it isn't so much you know you're building new infrastructure when you probably shouldn't because Mm -hmm. you're not designed to do that right that's why the bid is like every what is it eight years right that's why we're not having one until 2028 but now 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 you know california needs to like specific la is like hey i gotta figure out what we gotta do here we got seven years, more like six years now to get this stuff done. Right. Um, and, and that, even though that might make a lot of jobs, but at the same time, now it's all about location scouting, what we're going to do. And then, you know, what's going to happen right after everyone leaves? Yeah, Standing exactly. Waste, right. So, no, I hear you. It, it, it is fascinating just to talk about because because I am living, I see the sound ways, but at the same time, I kind of miss that feeling of like being able to go to a different city every Olympics to kind of take the feel. Right. This, this year is a little bit different simply because it's COVID. There's no way people, these guys can explore Japan like, like they normally would, you know? Right. But also at the same time, I wonder if one of the reasons why people like the idea of it always being a different city is kind of going along with the idea of like exoticizing a foreign country, you know, which can have its own kind of, you know, questionable things there too. I'm not saying that, you know, everyone's like saying like, Oh, I, I'm totally into Japanese culture now because I'm watching the games, but I'm just saying that like, I think that if we're getting together to celebrate feats of human athletic ability, you know, and trying to determine essentially like, okay, who has the best weightlifter? Yeah. Who has the best fencer? Who has the best rower? You know, like, I, I think, like like I said, you can have a country host in a preset location, and then they can bring their culture to that location. Yeah. And you can still get that. So, like I said, let them design the cute animal uh, mascots. Okay. Let them s- design the food court and, like, set up specialty meals for, like, here's a whole bunch of home dishes yeah. from our culture, you know? But I think that... Oh, what are you really going to lose as a home viewer? Oh, you don't get a shot of like pagodas on your TV in between events. They can still show you that like, here's a look at the country that is hosting, but we're also in Toronto, but here's what Japan looks like, you know? Oh, I hear ya. All right, guys. So we're going to jump up and we're going to talk about actual events that have happened so far yes. within the Olympics. Um, I will be the basic Olympic viewer. I am very happy that the U.S. men's basketball team decided to whip Iran. I'm sorry, Iran. Look, like they needed, they needed a, re- they, they needed a reset, and they had to do yeah. it. 
uh, you know, at the time of this recording, tomorrow morning they're going to play Czech Republic, and they're mm. going to absolutely destroy Czech Republic because there's no one really on that team um, to do that. So it's a good reset after losing to Argentina the first of their pool games. I was mm-hmm. watching highlights of the U.S. women's uh, soccer team. Oh, thank you, Megan Rapino. Uh, <laughs> coming in clutch uh, with those PK kicks. I mean, you know, the, the teams that I think they're supposed to dominate for us as a U.S. is starting to, like, make me nervous a little bit. Right. But, yeah. you know, with, with basketball, I think a lot of it is, like, the talents catching up to them. In mm-hmm. women's soccer, I think a lot of it is, you know, they're gunning for the U.S. women, which I think is very good, uh, at least competition-wise, to kind of show uh, where these guys have uh, built up since the four years. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple other things I've been watching, I was telling you, like, I was watching Badminton. <laughs> I was like, Badminton's crazy. <laughs> it, it, Have you, you know, seen how fast those people go? Like, listen, I played Batman in my backyard, sitting up a fence. Yeah. And, like, it was never that intense. Yeah, ba- Batman, you know, it, it's always, you know, apologies to everyone that went during a high school. Us, as a high school basketball team, freshman, sophomore year, mm-hmm. I know they try to get onto the court right after we are done practicing basketball. Our team made sure we drew out that basketball practice to <laughs> to kind of do it right and, you know but but i but watching badminton it's really fun to just watch and kind of got me back into kind of watching that and then i saw scott some of the table tennis which mm-hmm. i always think of forrest gump and i'm like oh this really is happening right like these guys are just absolute nuts with rallies that are happening but you tell me greg what have you been watching and what has gotten you really excited over the past week well, first of all, one thing that I'm actually really excited about is how young some of these competitors are. In table tennis, I forget what country she's from. I think it might be Azerbaijan. But there's a 12-year-old girl competing in table tennis, going toe-to-toe with athletes who have been doing this for, like, decades. And, like, while I don't think she's going to medal, it's still amazing that she's even in the same league as these people. Uh, speaking of younger competitors, I recently watched the women's uh, skateboarding competition. And uh, I believe that the average age of the entire podium was 15. Like it was two 13 year olds and a six. So young. Year old. Tony Hawk right? is but, like, very proud right now. Right. And like, I, I feel like with some of the new sports we're starting to introduce and try out, that's going to be a trend that's going forward is that younger and younger talent. The ones who have just that raw ability, maybe it's a little bit less uh, trained and refined, but it's good enough to get them into the actual arena. Um, one that I'm looking forward to very much so, but haven't had a chance to view yet is sports climbing. I've seen some of the previews and some of the trial matches of sports climbing. Have you seen that at all? It is intense. It is. I I gotta check it out. No, they have a speed climbing. I swear these people are like, they must've got tips from Spider-Man himself because they just run up that wall as fast as they can. And then of course you have the, um, I think the exact term is like obstacle climbing or something where it's a bit more like of a of a uh, hazards and maze they have to climb up through but that's going to be an amazing sport i've also been a big fan this year of the canoeing and kayaking going through those different gates i've always been a fan of the winter olympics that reminds me of the ski gates of downhill slopes so it's uh, fun to see that uh the other big surprise for me this year that i didn't know i'd be this much into though is handball I was always a fan of water polo, but I was like, oh, okay, I'll try handball. Yeah. Oh, it's like water polo if the pool like evaporated. <laughs> if if it's, they like, were on land. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. like for some reason, like I slept on that, like in previous games. Mm-hmm. I'm watching handball now. Like those people jumping up and just slamming that ball into that uh, net is intense. Yeah. But, um, the, the other thing that I did uh, talk about last time that's also very enjoyable is all the martial arts expos yeah. that they have. Um, I've been really heavy into judo. Uh, I haven't seen many of the karate matches yet, but the judo uh, matches have been really, really fun to watch. And I recently saw one in which I believe there was an athlete from Cuba pin a girl like almost immediately and pinned her for 20 seconds and it was like instant win. But such a fun match to watch. So definitely, guys, go check out the martial arts sports if you haven't already. They're really enjoyable. Also, I just want to say I am still iffy on the three-on-three basketball. But that being said... No, it's better, Johnny, Johnny. I'm not saying this. Okay, 
let me take that back. It's not better than five on five, but it's a good alternate. It's like sometimes you want a Coke, sometimes you want a Sprite, but you still want that soft drink. You're right. That being said, shout out to Kelsey Plum, Alicia Gray, Jackie Young, and Stephanie Dolson. Yeah, I'll take the gold. That's fine. Right? We can take that. Right? So, um, speaking of you know taking the gold, yeah, we have this new updated scorecard for everyone. Yeah, I saw to you took at. a couple golds, my friend. You took a couple golds this past week. So let's talk about some of the results here. Right. Um, you know, looking at what we're seeing so far, Eric here has a 11 metal edge over Phil right now, 105 to right. 94. Uh, what have you noticed within the countries, uh, how, how everyone is performing so far? Well, like I said, Japan is going to be an odds on favorite just because they are hosting. So they are going to have their thumb in every pie. Typically the host country competes in all the sports and Japan is no exception to that rule. So they have odds, increased odds to get medals because they're competing. It's, it's, you know, like playing the table. Um, Canada so far has also been doing really good, strong showings. So that's why a lot of the Canada Japan combos are doing a lot of favors to these players like Eric and Phil. New Zealand has really shown up as well in force. They have three golds, three silvers, and two bronzes thus far. That's a solid 17 points in this game. So that's doing many of our field uh, favors. We have 12 players in this official field. Half of them have New Zealand, including you, Johnny. So every time that New Zealand's getting points, half of the field's getting points. As I predicted, though, Australia, once the water sports started in earnest, Australia started to show up. And thus far, Australia has a total of nine gold, two silver, and 11 bronze. So I told you, Johnny, once once we start getting wet, that's when you're going to get your points. That's going to be your bread and butter right there. Um, surprisingly, though, uh, and I don't know if you've shared uh, my my different nations in the rankings. Yeah. The, the, the blue rankings have been pretty even. Netherlands could step up their game a bit more, but France, Germany, Italy, South Korea, they're all pretty much in there with each other. Mm-hmm. I was really shocked thus far at how underscoring Spain and Brazil have been. I mean, Cuba, I'm hoping they're going to come around with a little bit of the later track and field and baseball, softball. They've been almost nothing. Yeah. Kenya has yet to report in. (laughs) But I think that's because, like I said, track and field, especially the long distance running, which they're known for, hasn't actually started to meddle yet. They're still doing runs and qualifiers uh, just as we're starting now. Same with Jamaica. Jamaica's typically known for sprinting. I'm not making this up. Go watch Cool Runnings. The first 10 minutes, you'll know what I'm talking about. (laughs) So that also, they haven't reported in yet. But I was hoping that at least Poland and Azerbaijan and Denmark would have had a bit more of an impact. It seems that in the black rings, only New Zealand is the one who's actually playing the game. Right. The green and red rings, um, you know, they've been a bit slow as well argentina i'm a bit disappointed i keep seeing argentina poke its head up in comp- competitions and then they get knocked back down usually by us or china yeah so that's that's a bit disappointing there um i was a bit surprised to see serbia search and have seven points in that green tier so that was impressive um but the real surprise to me is croatia croatia and the red tier which is the lowest ranking tier has 13 points this early on which is Quite impressive. South Africa behind them with seven. Um, I'd like to see Sweden uh, have a few answers back. But really, at this point, though, thankfully, I do have Croatia. And they have been a saving grace to cover my yellow rank uh, Cuba team, which has had done me next to no favors. So at this point, um, there's been a few poll position changes. The biggest one, of course, was John. John had a three uh, position increase since last time we talked. Uh, So he is now solidly in the eighth position. Uh, You, Johnny, um, you actually maintain your fifth place position uh, while the rest of the point, like I said, when people gain points, you gain points. Um, But that's a few pluses and minuses of ones and twos here and there. But since last time we talked, mostly the field stayed the same, except for John, who decided to finally wake up his team (laughs) and march forward a bit more. I mean, that's that's great for his part. Look, 
I would like to win, but I would rather place. If I get to at least into the top three, that would actually be pretty cool. Looking at these standings Well, I can here, promise you top 12. How does that sound? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was looking at these standings here. I need Argentina to do... Argentina needs some to wake work. Up. Some yeah. some work. Well, the problem is if Argentina, Argentina, Argentina actually starts winning, Phil gets more points. And this is kind of where this pool messes me up because I'm like... You know, I need them to win, but then I need New right. Zealand to continue their trend because. But, so you and Phil both have Canada yes. and Argentina, but I think what the difference is going to be is your New Zealand. Mm-hmm. I think your New Zealand versus his Jamaica is going to be what the difference is, and hopefully, if New Zealand continues their trend, they actually might be able to pull off that because Phil does have Japan, you have Australia. Yeah. Australia has been surging really strong right now. But unfortunately, we're also coming near the end of the aquatic sports. Yeah. So you had a really good surge in the middle there. But unless you start to finish really strong and shut Japan off of that podium with right. other nations, I don't know if that's going to be enough to make up for the deficit. Right. And uh, that's all I can hope for. You know, um, one of our co-hosts on the Moral Combat podcast, David, you know, mm-hmm. put his picks in here, oh. too. Oh, sweet David. Oh, David. Come on, man. Like, if it wasn't for Serbia right now, I mean, you would be under 20 points. <sighs> that, that is that Honestly, is rough. yeah. Like I said, Serbia, he's got seven there. Uzbekistan, four. Azerbaijan is really underperforming with only one. But I, I, I have hope for David with Kenya. I really think that, like I said, once track and field really kicks off, there's a lot of different competitions, a lot of sprints. Also, a lot of long distance running there, and I think they could really do a massive killing there if he's lucky. No, well, we got about tw- when does the Olympics end again? August eighth. Yes, August eighth. Okay, so we have about I, a week I, left. I, a little I bit still more got nine days, so you mm-hmm. know, next time we come back, this picture will get more clear as we go along. Uh, Greg, thanks again for joining oh, my me here. Uh, if you guys want to catch Greg, he has several podcasts out. You can mm-hmm. check him out on the Moral Combat podcast. Uh, if you want to check him out with him and his wife, Lauren, they have two. Friday is game night if you're a board game enthusiast, escape room mm-hmm. enthusiast. Uh, or if you want to check out movies that they talk about or show each other for the first time, Movie Date Night is a good one as well for you guys to check out. All the links will be below uh, that you can click on. Again, Thank Greg, thanks again for joining us. You guys, my pleasure. We'll see you next week when we wrap up the Olympic talk here with Greg. I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a good one, everybody.